Like, yeah, chill out. It's probably just right, everyone good. Everyone see? Okay, 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 okay. All right, so this is the Quadrata font, Textura font. Um, this is the font that the the very well educated um, and artist characters use uh, within within the monastic community. So Garnet was not the abbot the last time that the Baron visited. And he's like, oh yeah, I guess I did meet you. I don't, I don't remember you. The Baron's not the greatest dude, by the way. You weren't kidding about big head <laughs> causing bugs, yep. Bye, Sir Duany. So the Baron is like, yeah, I wanna look at the book, but let me go get something to eat. I'm just gonna go to the kitchen. The, bear, the abbot is like, uh, all right. So the Baron is very uh, used to getting what he wants and he kind of just does whatever. At a certain point, I think he talks about how his uncle was the, the abbot of Fulda. So he has an overly familiar sense of entitlement when he's in an, uh, um, an abbey. It's kind of annoying to everyone, but he's rich and he can kind of do what he wants. So uh, he's kind of mad at me. Uh, why are you taking this out on me? He's not my problem. <laughs> See you later, dude. Oh, the abbot growls at you. I <laughs> uh, should have asked him for an advance on the gardener's taxes. Maybe I could just convince Brother Matthew to pay me early. Who's Brother Matthew? Hey. There he is. <laughs> we all love Brother Matthew. He was one of the first characters within the first batch of characters that we had to find. Um, Andreas was first, but then we took a handful of the monks and did an experiment to see what their design was gonna be because we knew right off the bat that it was going to be a challenge with so many characters, specifically the monks, because we have a bunch of men of a somewhat similar age, all wearing Outfit. the exact same clothes. And so we needed to play with their shapes and scales and hair and all that to try to set them apart as much as possible. This is Brother Rüdiger. He is the um, cantor for the brothers. Dropping a beat in the church. <laughs> Monk's got pipes though. So yeah, this is April. It's after Easter. So Andreas is asking about singing for mass, Easter mass. Um, uh, we worked with Alchemy and said, what would he be singing? And they're like, he would sing this after Easter. He would not sing it before, he'd sing it after. So the, um, I think it's Pashale Laude something, um, but the song is specifically chosen because it would have been sung literally at this time. And it's a very pretty song. That's right, I need to look at my map. So we, we tell you to bring the map up when you get to the Abbey because it's quite quite a uh, tangled <laughs> mess of locations. Um, we tried to make the layout of the Abbey as plausible and realistic. Um, it has a loquarium, it has a refectory, it has the chapter house, um, animal pens, all these things. Um, not all abbeys were exactly the same, but they had lots of common elements. The cloister, of course, the church, the dormitory. Um, this one is unusual in some ways because it was built on some ruins. Um, so you have an old bailey around where the old abbey was in the scriptorium, kind of separated from the rest of the structure. Normally that would be adjacent to the cloister, but things don't normally, they don't always work out. <laughs> like lots of things are built on top of ruins. <laughs> Hey man, what's like up? Thirty percent of his body height is his head now. <laughs> He's very good. Oh, he's tiny. <laughs> I really like that he's... his entire hand could fit behind one lens of his glasses. <laughs> I really like that technically he has eyes, but the only people that will ever see them are the developers. It's really horrifying when you see him with his glasses <laughs> off too. Yeah. <laughs> Especially when he's making like, it, like I think there was a bug where when he made an angry face, his glasses would pop off and it was like yeah. the worst combination. It was haunting. We stand a short king. <laughs> he's a weird little dude. He is, he's 
That's weird, though. He's got a weird personality. Yeah, no, for sure. He's summed up as just weird. Like, he's not unpleasant, but he's he's got his quirks. He's definitely a team favorite. <laughs> the little guy. He looks like the fashion designer from The Incredibles. <laughs> <laughs> He's got the, uh, what's that? No hair? capes. The haircut, yeah. the camera yeah, on it. Yeah, yeah. French Bob. Oh, uh, we didn't give me the pay. This isn't Edmund part of the agreement Lee. we made with Father yeah. Garnett. You'll be paid on the completion of each additional manuscript you eliminate, not before. <laughs> Anna Wintour. Wintour. <laughs> I only have a few pages left, Brother Matthew. <laughs> Can't you make an exception this once? Not without good reason. This abbey runs through mutual agreements, not haphazard payments. Breaking such contracts would cause undue trouble not only for Kurosawa but Tassing as well. As a bit early on in the development, um, someone, I don't remember who did this, but printed out a sheet with a bunch of Matthews Kathy. on it um, that were about an inch and a half tall and hid them around the office. And so there's still, a lot of them are still there. We still find Matthews to this day. And Kate still has one in her phone case. I do too, yeah. <laughs> You both do? Yeah. <laughs> Who is the burgle of this game? The burgle? I don't know if there is a burgle of it. Yeah, I don't think. We do, oh, have, we cook. do have a cook. We do have a cook. We do have a cook. All right, time to get. <laughs> <Luke is> the <laughs> burgle. That doesn't feel right. <laughs> yeah. Here they are, the boys. Here's the boys. This is Guy. Boys night. Guy is the young scribe. There's a young scribe and an old scribe. And there's an old artist, and you, you are essentially taking the place of the young artist. You're not going to train another artist within the abbey, so that's why you're being hired as a, essentially a freelancer. It's that Guy. How's your morning going, Brother Guy? It's fine. <laughs> More onk tracks. That's, that's actually very unusual. Guy has an extremely low error rate, so both he and Attic, they don't just use different fonts. Um, characters also have different error rates and writing speeds. So Guy and Attic have both have very low error rates and very high um, speed rates. <laughs> Nothing changed for freelancers. And Guy is saying he doesn't care what he's writing. He's like, I'm just, I, I'm just need to impress the abbot. Uh, he's still a young man, and he basically says like, he's from Burgundy, and he's like, I'm never gonna see my home again, so I gotta make the best of the next 40 years. And Bur Burgundy at this point was now uh, absorbed into France, but it's still very powerful. And then we got my buddy Attic. High cat density on the margin of there. <laughs> yeah. Brother, brother Attic likes, um, I was gonna say anagrams, yeah. Literal nut. All right. Are we sticking with big head mode? Not uh, for a bit. This is Brother Piero, your your best bud. I want to braid his beard. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the beards do get quite big in big head mode, yeah. especially if you put that slider way up. Guy and Ada have an, well. Two typos. Yeah, that's, just have that's crazy, yep. Yeah. Don't forget the fate of the youths who jeered the aged prophet Elijah outside of Bethel. They were mauled by she-bears, which by the way, if you have a theology background, you can mention that, which I like. <laughs> it's uh, Second Kings, it's one of my, f it's gotta be one of my favorite funny Old Testament passages. Max big head mode? No, I'll show you real briefly and then. It's, it's too much for me. Max big head mode is, that's, the heads are just, they're too big. 42 she bears, thank you. Shiloh likes it. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that you can still see the physics and it wrapping as he looks down, even though it's not interacting with his body. I like Piero's, it's like blasting off. <laughs> Attic, what have they done to you? Two croissants. <laughs> oh, his beard, his split beard like that does look like feelers to me. Like he could uh... All right, let's. All right. <laughs> Secret money. We got a gee low-key cute. Mm -hmm. Are those Sujin's Maybe. cats? Yeah. Uh, those ones are Elena's. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. Elena's. Yes. 
Oh, what is historical lettering? Um, it turns on long S's and I think something else. Hold on. Long S's are F's are S's and to someone that doesn't have a background reading script there you go. that's written like that, it's very funny to me because it just, I just read it like this. Yeah, so you can see, you can see this is historical lettering. It's, um, it's, using, it's using the long S, which looks like a, an F letter form. Um, and there are rules for where it appears. Um, it wasn't strict historically, but uh, yeah. A lot of people don't like that, I do, but I'll turn it off for legibility. <laughs> It's, it's not the end, and it's never doubled, and it's never next to an F, I think. It, 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 there's, yeah, it kind of, it kind of. Threaten, threaten Guy with my rap scallion. Threatening a monk, what's wrong with you? You're the one mocking old men, what's wrong with you? <laughs> anyway, what's the problem? The Baron is just one client. The Dark Souls of reading text. <laughs> So this is the real reason why everyone is scared of the Baron. He's friends with the Prince Bishop of Freising, who is very powerful. Religious and secular ruler of scattered territories of the Holy Roman Empire, including the lands containing Tassing and Kirsai Abbey. So very powerful guy. Do not want to make him mad. By the way, does this game have achievements? Are they relatively doable or extremely hard, like oh, Eternity 1? There's 41 of them, and they're not hard, but you can't get all of them on a single playthrough. So. Yep. Is that a radish with a face? Yes, it is. This all is of our, pretty much all of our marginalia is a um, tribute to an existing piece of marginalia, um, just to draw attention to how wild they are, as is. There wasn't a ton of inventing that needed to happen there because there are just so a lot. many examples of really, really charming characters that exist in those margins. So they're all different, they're all original, but they are usually referencing a piece that we did find as a historical partner piece. Was this game harder to translate for other languages? I don't think it was any harder necessarily um, than our other games, but we did have some challenges with our glossary and matching system. We had to introduce a wild card thing because most, well, most of the languages, but especially German and especially, especially Polish, um, they have uh, case and declinations. So we needed to use wild cards to make sure that as nouns changed uh, form, that they would still be highlighted correctly. I think we did it pretty well. Any Polish players in the chat, if you see an error, just it's, please bear with us. <laughs> we'll fix it. It's, it's hard. Polish is really hard to cover and make it all, all work. Oops. So um, there are two sisters that work inside the library, Sister Zdena and Sister Illuminata, and they're very, very different in many different ways. <laughs> Zdena is uh, kind of a sass, and Illuminata is very serious. And she's flirting with me. I mean, did you sleep alone? So she's like, oh, your hair is messy. Did you sleep alone? Why do you want to know? It would be nice to have something to think about during divine reading, which is a real, a real thing. It still is a real thing. <laughs> have you considered the Lord? Have <laughs> you considered the Lord? It's such a good <laughs> Illuminata was the name of an actual saint. I want to say it was a ninth century Italian saint. Uh, what did you have to do to adjust the script writing system for other languages? Is it translated in any non-Latin alphabet languages? Right now, it is only translated into Latin alphabet languages, so it is supported in all those languages. Um, we are working on solving other languages for the future. It's time. Time for her to appear. There she is. So referring to the rule, which is the rule of St. Benedict of, of Nursia. 
This is the overriding rule that most monastic communities live by. Um, later orders had their own rules, rule of St. Francis, for example. So she's complaining about Sister Zidana, and I'm like, eh, give her a break. Charitable. So the idea here, by the way, is that even though these monks and sisters technically work um, under the same sort of rule of Father Garnett, um, they still try to keep them separated during work hours because they don't want them to be distractions. So the sisters work in the library and the monks work in the scriptorium and they only communicate through the door, which is locked. So Andreas is in the process of making his, man his masterpiece and because the master of the scriptorium, Prior Ferenc, is not present, he's like, I'm just gonna work on this. <laughs> I'm not gonna work on the actual commission I'm supposed to be doing, I'm gonna work on my book of hours. And Piero's giving a little critique of it. And Piero's critique is, yeah, it looks nice, it looks like a nice imitation of someone else, someone else's stuff. Can you talk about the, the Limburg brothers? Limburg brothers from the, uh, they were the artists who were the main artists for the, uh, the French Riche or the Duc de Berry. Yeah, yeah um, I actually don't know that much personal history about them as people, but that particular book of ours was referenced a lot um, for this masterpiece. Um, and part of that was because it has a vibe that is uh, much closer to the um, sort of guild work within Books of Hours that we were transitioning into this phase next. So prior to this, it had been um, a much more classical style of illustrations that were made primarily for the use in the church um, and commissioned by the church. And as this time period is a transition phase between the era that art was made by and for those clients into this new kind of somewhat secular era where it was rich individual clients buying things for personal use. Um, that is closer to the sort of modern for this time period look that something like a book of hours would have looked like. So instead of referencing um, some of the older German examples of prayer books like that, we wanted to reference that French one as an example because um, it did feel like it was the more uh, kind of innovative for this time period art style within that space. So he's not working for the church. He's here working for, um, you know, on his masterpiece for himself. We kind of had some discussions about, you know, back when we were deciding what exactly his masterpiece should be. It's kind of unusual that it's something like a book page, especially in isolation. He has this one example. Um, so even you can though, assume there's more. You can assume there's more. <laughs> but what we're showing here is just that and, um, for him to choose to do something like that, he would want to show it as an example of, you know, this is this is a new modern, um, you know, as as cool as I can make it example of what I can do. You know, he's trying to prove himself as his introductory piece here. Um, so that's why that one was chosen. Are there any parallels between the scriptorium and a game video? <laughs> yes, we need to protect our backs. Absolutely. A um, bunch of people sitting at their desk all day. <laughs> Dark room. So this is not marked on, oh, it's terse, yeah. So we don't mark terse on the monastic hours, but this is one of the little hours of prayer. So uh, they're all going to pray, and Andreas is not part of the monastic community, so he's gonna keep working. Were glasses a thing, or did you just have to retire after a while? They did exist, they weren't that great. Um, Brother Matthew wears glasses. There's another character, Jakob Estler, who wears glasses. I think those might be the two characters. So yeah, they existed, um, they, but they were high specialty items and uh, they weren't awesome, but they did help. Even in Name of the Rose, uh, Brother William has a pair of glasses that he uses. But yeah, the time period for Name of the Rose is 100 Earlier, or it's, years, uh, 150 years? It's, yeah, about 100, 
almost 200 years. Okay, yeah. prior to the time period of yeah. our game. So um, the first round of glasses that I drew were wooden frame glasses because that is what they used in that one and I was making that parallel. But at this point, they're probably more likely to be made with um, wire frames and yeah. still rudimentary lenses. Is the Abbey design inspired by any specific Abbey? No, I think with the church and this hybrid sort of church and convent scenario, we were trying to make it as plausible as possible. So we looked at a bunch of different Abbey layouts and tried to pick something that the layout wasn't too confusing to navigate, but also made sense and included everything that we needed to without being too many unnecessary rooms. Um, so not one specific that I can think of. I think we did reference Marlboron quite a bit, but because um, that's a really well-preserved. I think that's part of it. There's just a lot of record of the um, the layout of that place that we could reference. Inclu and architectural details, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are, and correct me, but I think we used a combination of Romanesque and uh, Gothic elements for Kearsaw. Yes, uh, we tried to emphasize that, like, this was built on top of ruins in the first place and it's one of those things where you know they continue to build the building over time so this area the scriptorium is right on top of the fort that they found and built this whole place off of so this room looks older than ideally the rest of the um, abbey looks on this side the front side the front of the church the church feels a little more gothic in some of its um, borders and its textures that it's using because that would be the one of the more modern elements, they'd keep recycling, keep adding, you know, churches just continue to get built up and have more stuff added to them. So that place looks a little more modern than um, this area of the building. Um, it's very, very, very common in structures that survived through the Middle Ages that you can see this actually, um, and you can find these as well, um, the foundations like the crypt of Kearsaw is Roman. Um, it's from an old Roman fort. This part is like a Romanesque era with a Bergfried. That's what the library is. It's essentially built inside of the Bergfried. And then the rest of it is a more modern construction. It's super common to see multiple eras of, uh, of construction in a surviving structure. In some cases, because expansion happened later. And sometimes there were fires or other things that happened and they'd have to rebuild. Did the team take any field trips to any museums or locations for inspiration? Uh, we would have loved to have taken more. Uh, Pentiment was being developed for about four months, five months, actually in production prior to when the beginning of COVID happened and we transitioned to work from home. So at that point forward, we did not have the opportunity to take a lot of trips on site. Um, we did get the chance to go twice to the Getty, to the Getty um, and they have a really lovely collection of illuminated manuscripts there. They're not always, they don't have the full collection on display all the time, but the first show that we went to was actually specifically a bestiary illuminated manuscript show, which was really amazing to see. It was from, like books from a whole bunch of different eras, but to see them in person and to get to see the difference between what it looks like in a facsimile or the record of it online versus when it's in front of you. Like, um, I think the one takeaway I, I got from that personally, having not seen the books in person before, was just they are so remarkably small, They're a lot of them. Small. They're very tiny. And so this work that we see the scribes having been doing at the time, especially when they're enlarged, you know, on a screen like this. Um, you look at the way characters are portrayed and how they're simplified and it can feel kind of goofy. Their faces can be kind of wonky. But as soon as you realize that that face was painted like this big <laughs> on a page, Very it's like, small. of course it was. How could you have painted it any otherwise? That was neat. Those were the, those were the two trips that we did get to take in person. Uh, Malakola, this is Unity with our additional things. Yep. So right now they're walking around in the Aeneid, um, which Brother Piero was reading. Um, this whole sequence is because Sister Illuminata cannot enter the scriptorium, she can't make the brothers give back the books <laughs> that they borrow. Or just go grab them. Yeah, she, she can't, can't just like go in there and grab them. So she's pretty strict about that and Zidana doesn't care because uh, she just doesn't care. Um, so she's using Andreas's desire to know more about uh, the Baron to get him to return the books. What was the process behind the selection of the various fonts? I mean, I think it was just researching what would be... Yeah, I would, I would look up um, uh, Riley Cran and Letter Maddox interview. Uh, they did a couple of interviews recently, and they go into depth with it.
Now I'm going to get a printed book, Wretched Garen. So print was active. Uh, print was displacing. Deluxe manuscripts were really the only thing that was still being made at this point because cheap books, you would rather print them. It was much more economical for everybody. But this is a printed book called Wretched Garen. Wretched Garen was an Italian romance. Um, it first appeared in manuscript form, but then when it was printed, it became much, much more popular. Oh, there's the Polygon interview. Thank you. Thank you, Mikey. So this is a book that they were loaned by a Swiss nobleman and then it got lost and she's like, we have to return this book, he's super mad. And yeah, it's like a romance and it's an adventure, all sorts of nonsense happens. And uh, how many ligatures are there? I don't know off the top of my head, there's some. I like that Hannah describes Illuminata as being bowling pin shaped, which is not quite as obvious here, but in her <laughs> Normal stance. Yes. We see her stand up. Yeah. Absolutely. So she doesn't really like that the the monks are reading these like lusty adventure stories. Uh, the grumpy Illuminata face was also my icon on Slack yep. for a very long <laughs> it looks more garlic knot than bowling pin. It's good. The two genders. <laughs> Die a bowling pin or live long enough to see yourself become a garlic <laughs> Wish you knew Italian and could read Umberto Eco in his native language. I, yeah, I would imagine you'd have to know it pretty well and a bunch of other. I mean, that's the, with reading Echo, you better know a few languages just to kind of get through it. All right, last book. All right, I'll go get it. Uh, he was always guarded about this book, like he was hiding it. Great, <laughs> bring it over here. Pretty unique font on this one. Yeah, what is it? This is my Flanders background coming up. Oh, it's in French, great. doesn't really like you Sus. poking about it. <laughs> We're gonna get our, our heretic cross over. Yep. Hartman von Aout? No, we did not, sorry. Some, some romances, like Parts of All, come up, but we don't go super in depth with them. You, <laughs> there we go. Last so, one. Father Matthias is the previous abbot, and he loved books, and even though it was a heretical book, he didn't want to see it destroyed. And he's right to do so, a book shouldn't be destroyed. The Holy Church does not share your opinion. The church was wrong. <laughs> I'm not going to debate this with you, Andreas, and Father Matthias is gone. We got some Father Matthias support in the chat. Yeah, it's not my place to question the former abbot's decision. I'm not going to give it to you if you're just going to destroy it. What? Why not? What are you going to do with it? <laughs> this is my favorite. Read it and become a French heretic! <laughs> Richard, if you're still out there, there it is. <laughs> All right, now I'm going to try to make a check here. Uh, consider the sound theological reasons for allowing this book to exist. <laughs> More sound than a condemnation from three bishops of Paris? You don't have good odds there, Josh. <laughs> so this is how our persuasion uh, mechanic works. So based on choices that you made earlier that will feed into sort of this meter that determines whether or not you can convince her. Um, I don't have theology, and I yelled that the church was wrong to condemn the book. She double uh, didn't like that. Yeah, she really didn't like that, so I'm like, 
who are you going to trust, them or me? <laughs> Thank you the for making my decision here. so easy. <laughs> Did you leave university voluntarily or were you expelled? Um, I appeal to your duty as the librarian of this abbey to not destroy this book. My duty is to God and the vows I made, to the rule. Oh. But what about the librarian's rule, the rule to protect books? <laughs> no, you just made that up. <laughs> All right, I propose a compromise. I'll take the book from the abbey far away. It'll be gone by the time Father Garnet asks about it, and if you like, you can say I stole it. I didn't realize you could recheck with her so many times. Yeah. Like if you failed, you it's, failed. I made it so you could loop through it so you could see it in different instances, so when it comes up later, you're exposed to it. It's not too hard to get the book. If you really aggravate her, then it's really hard, but uh, I doubt he'll make a fuss about me stealing a book you want to destroy. I don't like it. I offered enthusiastically to help Illuminata. I swear I'll take it far away. It's been out here for years, and besides, how could you have stopped me? I'm trusting you. Don't make me regret this. Chivo. I got achieve. I got achieve, simple soul. Achievement acquired. <laughs> All right. So I can only ask her one question here. You said that he buys books from the Abbey. What kinds? How long has he been visiting the Abbey? Why is he so friendly with me? And he mentioned finding a copy of Historia Tassiae. He says it has scandalous details in it. I can only ask one question, chat. What am I asking about? What's the ponder? The ponder is she may only have time for one question. Uh, number one's at four. We have two for four. All right, Historia Tassiae. Yep. Oh, Everyone's four. saying four. Yep. He also mentioned that Father Matias had a copy and was looking for another to verify its contents. Do you know anything about the book? I have heard of it but I've never read it and I know little about its contents. The subject is broad, but I believe the book deals specifically with Roman occupation of this land. That book. <laughs> what about that could have upset Father Matthias so much? I can't claim any deep insights into the former abbot's mind. I understood him to be a virtuous and charitable man, sometimes to a fault. It is not always best when an abbot considers himself a friend to his brothers instead of their shepherd. Do you prefer Father Garnet to Father Matthias? My vocation requires me to obey. My preferences are irrelevant. But every child would choose that their parents err toward love. To err toward love is to stumble at the feet of God. So, <laughs> <laughs> yes or no? <laughs> well, I gotta go, thanks. Wait, how will you get to the church if you can't enter the scriptorium? I thought this was the only door into the library. We are standing in the oldest part of the abbey, and like any old place, it has its share of secrets. Good day, Andreas. God be with you. Bye. See ya. It's the bell for sex. The brothers will be sitting down for dinner soon. I should see if Otto is around and still wants to eat with me. We adjust the dinner supper thing for audiences that may not know. Yeah, dinner is lunch. It's very confusing to me for a long time. Supper dinner is, is lunch, supper is dinner. <laughs> Don't forget that. Well, it's critical. As a Midwesterner, supper is supper. Supper, yeah. <laughs> supper, supper. You've been here too long. <laughs> I've acclimated. Yes, dinner is the first one, supper is the second one. All right, here are the boys. There boys are. are eating. I can't eat with them right now, though. Yeah. Can I take a shortcut through the, yeah, I'm gonna take a shortcut through the abbot's house. Hello. This is the abbot's dog. I don't remember, how many dogs are there? There are. Five or six. Five or six. Yeah, there's four different types of dogs. Oh, that's, lo oh, that's right, that's locked. Three different types That's locked because Kate used to speed run through the abbot's house and oh. broke broke up part of the critical path. Oh, whoa, whoa. <laughs> All right, let me go through the chapter house. Kate's a top tier bug finder. <laughs> I kept asking her like, how did you miss this thing? And she's like, I don't know. And I'm like, did you go through the abbot's house? No. And then after a bunch of times, she's like, oh, I guess I did go through the abbot's house. I also would though, it's, it's way shorter than the other path. So I would do that quite a bit and then have to remember that we lock that now. Yes. Hey, what's that guy doing? Hey, it's Martin. It's the little kid who is being a jerk at the sheepied. Is he still a jerk? We'll find out. <laughs> He's 
busy. Brett, nice. Hey, Brett. <laughs> Kate, 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 yeah. <laughs> this is a Merton dialogue here. Merton, Merton and Martin, very good. Mm -hmm. Trying to help him steal. Remember, the Baron wouldn't keep his riches on the first floor. I'm not. How would you even know that? <laughs> I've had my share of adventures. I've you? never been able to appeal to Martin. I've never had really? this background and talked to him here. <laughs> You get a paintbrush stuck up your ass? <laughs> Martin is really aggravating. <laughs> Can't trick me, I wasn't doing anything. It's been a busy day, I'm having a break, enjoying the sun, nothing more. Don't mind me, I'm just helping out a fellow man. Does it look like you need your help, Andreas? Go piss into a bucket and pour it in your head. <laughs> Here are the boys. Brett and I, anti-Martin truists. We won't see. I don't think I've ever won him over either. I know the secret ways. <laughs> you know yet again. Yeah, yeah. A professor is teaching history and games, told about the game, and yeah, we're giving 20 copies of the game for teaching a class. It's very cool. I'm yep. very happy about that. Yeah. Love the idea of thinking about the game being interacted with in that way. I think that's really neat. One of the things I'm most excited for about what we're doing here and this kind of story that we've made is that I think there'll be all sorts of people that might gravitate towards a game like this, either from a background in games or from the background in history. And I think that's really interesting. Um, I can't wait to talk to people that are experiencing the game that, um, you know, or maybe fresh to games or just checking it out because they're curious. Did this game go through any big changes during development or was it a pretty clear idea all the way through? It felt pretty pretty clear the whole way. I think the vision was pretty clear. I mean, we obviously iterated on a lot of stuff, but. Um. I will say one thing when it came to like evidence, I think one of the biggest changes from our prototype is we just completely got rid of everything to do with alibis because it's not interesting. We're, because we're not, all it does is exclude people. So we're just like, we never talk about it. <laughs> yeah. Everyone's available to murder. I think in general, the thing that probably changed the most over time was thinking about how we wanted to be a mystery game because that can mean a lot of different things um, and imply a lot of different mechanics. And so we knew that it was important from a narrative perspective and we wanted that for the pacing and the timing of the story beats. But when you start getting into the nitty gritty about what that means to be a narrative game and like, yeah, collecting clues, collecting evidence, like we really wanted everything to be secondary to the impact of the story. So we wanted just enough so that you could be guided and experience the mystery aspect of the story without having these systems become something that was really complicated and kind of pulled our resource away from where we wanted to invest it, which was in the story and the art. Are those crumbs in the top right or tiny potatoes? <laughs> who can say? So these are two guys who, they work in town, but they also work for the Abbey. Otto is doing a bunch of restoration work for the Abbey. Um, and then, um, sorry, Endress is the town blacksmith and he casts pilgrim badges. But Otto really, really does not like the Abbey. Any scene setting movie recommendations in the time period? Hey Josh, you tweeted some out, right? Yep, uh, Name of the Rose, of course, uh, Mill and the Cross. Andre Rublev. Yep, uh, Return of Martin Gare. Return of Martin Gare, yeah. yeah. All excellent movies, just on their yeah, own, but also really, really great um, prefaces to the, the setting that we're doing. We watched a lot of movies as a team. That was one of the practices that we did, especially once we transitioned to being a remote team. We made sure to have movie nights together where we were just watching these as a team, partially for kind of research, especially just thinking about how uh, a film has narrative themes and mood and stuff captured, what its pacing is, looking at mystery films, but also just to have that time that we're spending together on a social level as a team, because you had a lot of makeup to do for um, the lack of in-office interaction. Like, we weren't a team that started that way. We were used to working together in person and how to transition off of it, so that was one of the ways in which we kind of invested in the social health of our team, as well as doing some media research so I think over time, the things that we were sourcing in the movies that we were watching maybe got goofier and a little off topic. Oh yeah, topic, we started like, eh. But it started really good. <laughs> did we watch Black Death? Yes. Yeah. Yes, we did. <laughs> uh, Not really that appropriate. Oh, yes, but... and Cadfell. Cadfell. Well, Cadfell started 
pre-pandemic. And I oh, remember that's right. we, yes. we would come out into the main lounge and the whole team had slankets. So we would put our robe <laughs> slankets on and just like They'd be like, there out. goes the pentiment procession and There's we're all like lurking into of, the... Of robes. <laughs> They're right here, comfy, where we're filming that, right now. I think we talked about Seventh Seal, but did we actually watch it? Seventh Seal, I oh. hope to still watch with the team. That's Maybe, right. I think we had intended to, and somehow it got bumped. Yes, it yeah. got bumped for something else. That guy looks like Alec Otto? <laughs> Not anymore. Not anymore. Alec looks different now. <laughs> <laughs> John Beans cannon and Pentiment confirmed. <laughs> no comment. Yeah, Andre, the Criterion Collection, Andre Rublev is really incredible. And Moss Film has it on, um, you can just watch the whole thing on YouTube. Flesh and Blood. Yeah, I, I actually watched Flesh and Blood. That probably would not have been, uh, that's a very early Verhoeven and it's, it's very Verhoeven. <laughs> it's, it's a lot, man. Storm's coming. Big Yorg is right. That stink is in the air. <laughs> the storm stink. The storm stink, yeah. Say hello to Ava for me. A lot of Ava auto talk going on here. They're hoveniest. Time to go back to work. All right, we got about 15 minutes. All right, got Matthew. What are you doing out here? Thought you were aware that in addition to my role as Kyrsaw's sacrist, I tend to the shrine of St. Moritz. St. Moritz is an actual saint of the Catholic Church. Um, he is described here as having specific history with tassing. And he takes care of the reliquary. I'm Andreas, I am never aware of anything. <laughs> I think Andreas was a fun challenge, um, and you can probably speak to this more, but we wanted him to feel like an individual. Like, you aren't coming in here, this is not a completely blank slate character. He's not a link. Um, but we did want to give you space to occupy your own version of Andreas and feel like you had agency over his choices and who he was. Um, but that's balanced with the fact that he still has his own backstory and history that he's coming into this story with. So is that a challenge, kind of designing around this avatar player character that was already a person versus just like working from scratch? Um, I think it actually makes it easier. Um, having the scope kind of be more narrow and focused, I think it makes it easier. Also because Andreas is not a local, he's an outsider, we still have that kind of the player's outsider perspective to like, what's up with St. Moritz? Like. Yeah, Yeah, because he maybe he might have heard of him, but he wouldn't really know all the details about his history here. Nice haircut, Alec. Thank you. Shyla did it. <laughs> so you hear lots of legends about Moritz and St. Satya, who's the other local patron saint of Tassing. We got good trees. Trees are good. Wait until you see one of my favorite parts about the art of the game is that as the acts progress, we feature the story is taking place in different seasons. So the backgrounds and the landscape changes with the seasons as well. And I think that feels really cool when it, when you can see it, when it happens. So this is the reliquary with the hand of St. Moritz, which is once said to have held the Holy Lance. The Holy Lance, all the Evangelion people go crazy. So like, um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, like real thing. And then, uh, so yeah, this is their relic. And then pilgrims come and the locals come to pray uh, and to see the relic. These are pilgrims. This is a local guy who's praying for his wife. But I'm gonna go back into the scriptorium so you can see a little bit more of the story. In terms of hardware requirements, can it run on a non-NVIDIA laptop so the plain Intel graphics chip? So our, our requirements are on the Steam page if you wanna take a look. Um, we haven't really tested it on integrated graphics. Um, so it does get pretty low. Nice. But um, yeah. Integrated might be tight. Is 
So this is the prior, prior Ferenc, and he's overseeing everyone, and he's being very, very fussy and kind of mean because he's under a lot of pressure. Take the, take the high road here. <laughs> then Guy being the suck up. I agree, he sucks. Toxic workplace, <laughs> hey, man. Attic isn't taking it. Piero's like, everyone settle down, it's my fault, he's right. Talk more about the 3D faces. If Kathy is still in the um, chat, maybe Kathy can talk more about the 3D faces. Yeah, just to preface it until Kathy jumps in, um, we kind of had this thing um, where we are. Uh -huh. Oh, I was just going to say, point out, uh, Brett Farazel is Brett, um, and he's talking okay, about the requirements are. there. So feel free to listen to what he has to say about that. But go ahead. Yeah, Kathy jumped in for a second. Phases are more 2.5D. So we had a moment where we have, you know, our characters are shown in three-quarter view pretty much in either direction. And the transition between facing from one side to the other um, was difficult to not make feel hitchy. Uh, it was a kind of quick snap if we went between there and didn't do frames that were drawing each transition direction between then, we'd have to kind of hand draw each character face, which with as many characters as we have in the game, that just would have been way too time consuming. So Kathy and the animation team developed a system that kind of makes this 3D effect with the faces using 2D pieces, so they slide based off of you know, varied speed to feel 3D when they rotate. Um, and it has a really cool effect and ended up being, you know, we designed it to solve that issue with the face snapping, um, switching directions, but it allows us to have some really cool nuanced expressions in ways that we wouldn't have had at all if we um, weren't using that system. So it had even more benefits than uh, why we integrated it in the first place, but I think it looks amazing. And there's some really cool moments where it's like, they feel very dynamic with that face system. Yeah, so it's great that you just asked about the Steam Deck. Um, we actually just got our green check mark for that. Um, so we are going to be Steam Deck verified. Um, it will be available on that. Uh, if you, you brought up Proton on Linux, um, yes, it should work. So uh, that's, all, that's all approved and ready to go. Steam Deck verified, yep. That'll be going live on the Steam page soon, so you'll see that green check mark on there very soon. All right, we got 10 minutes. So in that scene, uh, what happened there was the Baron went, came and visit. He did not like the illustrations that Brother Pierre was doing and asked if Andreas could do them. The abbot was not very happy with that, but said, sure, if that's what you want. And then uh, the Baron said, what if Andreas comes to supper and sits at the high table? And the Baron was like, I don't know about that. And, or uh, the abbot said, I don't know about that. And the Baron said, I think you do. And the abbot said, sure, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lavatorium. Everyone's got to wash up where they go and eat. So I'm here chit chatting, and Piero was saying, Yeah, you, you can talk, but we can't talk to you because we're not sitting at the fancy table with the, the fancy people. to think about like they have guests at this instance but it would normally just kind of be Gerna and a couple others up yeah. there yeah the solo table yeah it's the it's the the sort of the favorites of the abbot up there and they get they get much better food or the abbot whatever the abbot's eating um yeah if patreon existed the baron would be subscribing to andres <laughs> <laughs> that's good Smash that like and subscribe button. <laughs> Will there be a notes page no. to take your own journal notes? There is not a notes page. <clears throat> All right, so this is, um, you know, as well as we could represent it in this, in this thing, this is pretty close to how the meals would go. So you have the abbot's table where the nicest food is served 
Um, and there is discussion at the table, although as Piero said, the abbot generally doesn't like a lot of chit chat. The other brothers are eating in silence, but there is a lector, uh, literally a reader, who is um, Brother Matthew. He is the uh, sacrist and he's doing the reading. And he's reading from the book of Matthew. How historical is the hand washing? Um, lavatoriums existed as part of many abbeys. So everyone go in, wash up, go eat. So right away the Baron's like, let's let's have some chit chat. I'm like, yeah, I've, I've read some Matthew. <laughs> they all face in one direction at IRL. No, this was a design choice. We don't show characters facing the completely back. back away from the camera in general. Um, because medieval art also didn't. Really. Medieval art didn't. It's also just not as engaging to the viewer's space. So in this instance, it's a little strange because they're on the one side of the table, but it just worked so much better for what yeah. we needed the scene to be. No food for Tiny Matthew. That's why he's so tiny. He's malnourished. He doesn't eat. He just reads. <laughs> yeah, he gets books for dinner. <laughs> so Lawrence Rothvogel, the Baron, just said the magic words, which were Martin Luther. <laughs> dun, dun. And the abbot's like, I'm going to talk about quail. Like, quail? What are you talking about? Is this an adventure game first and foremost? It's a narrative adventure game. So not really puzzle focused, uh, more just on the story. So to answer the touch overlay for Xbox Cloud or xCloud, um, there's going to be a very basic one at release. Um, and we'll maybe take a further look down the road. Uh, but there should be a really basic one to allow you to play it on xCloud. Everyone stop chewing. <laughs> Everyone's very mad Extremely because this debate mad. is going on. Father Garnet finally is puffing up and getting angry. And the Baron is like, yeah, reform's coming, deal with it. Does not like that. Martin Luther is the final boss. <laughs> <laughs> I see. All right, the Baron's like, okay, I got it. Like, all right, fine, I'll still make my donations and buy the book. See you later, I'm mad. <laughs> <laughs> Blink twice if Josh is like, or no one came to <laughs> Are there house cats in the story? No, because house cats didn't really exist for a long time. It's uh, interesting, cats are around in the game. Uh, cats were not really kept indoors, and um, in many cases were not even considered really owned. Um, they were kind of just the cats that were around. Yeah. House chickens, though. Like, there's actually, um, it's uh, Louis Wayne, the artist, kind of popularized uh, domesticated house cats in the UK in the early, was it early 20th or late 19th century? But like, late 19th. but yeah, for a long time, cats were just kind of like around. Universal public cat. <laughs> Right. Leo's gonna comfort us and then we can run away. Yep. He's just saying, yeah, it'll work out. Don't worry about it. Piero is the Abbey Goblin. <laughs> <laughs> Sleepy time. That was new by. <laughs> All right. We got time for a couple of spooks. Oh yeah, let's let's walk through the meadow quick. Yep. Actually I'll end after Amelie, so that's yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. I think we can yeah. might might push the hour a tiny bit, is that okay? All right. Gotta go home, time to go to sleep. <laughs> I'm just here with my night sheet. <laughs> you all right, Master Mahler? Are there typos on purpose? Yes. Yep. The typo rate varies Maybe. depending on who is writing them and how good they are at creating scripts. Could be a Roman, maybe even old pagan. Wouldn't be the first time. Interesting. <laughs> well, I think I found Johan's last lost sheep. I'm gonna head home. 
See, the lost sheep make a comeback. <laughs> yes. Take care, Master Mahler. I will, thank you, Till. The spirits can't get you if you have a sheep by your side. By the way, just to, uh... oops, that's not what I wanted. In the journal, since we've been walking around, see, it's been populating with all the people that we've been collecting, collecting over time. Catch them all. Your Pokedex of folks. Mm -hmm. Your Pokedex. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta catch them all. Yeah. <laughs> The Amelie theme is actually Quio, Quio, uh, uh, Quio Ergo uh, Femina, which is written by Hildegard of Bingen, so it's an actual historical piece. You ask someone if they're a spirit, they legally have to <laughs> I've heard that. Sister Amelie is a mystic. <laughs> she has visions. What's she doing in there? She lives there. She lives in the cell. And he gives her communion through a window. She is an anchoress, a religious hermit. <laughs> the Amelie theme had an accordion. Nice. Bumping and use <laughs> so he's explaining that many, many mystics are, um, they're not literate, and so they need their priests to write down their visions. He came to mass. You would see her. She's not there. a beguine. She is not a beguine, but she is. Um, she is an anchorite, or she's an anchoress, and she is a mystic. But now that he knows that she's illiterate, he's like, "Oh, okay." So she's another character where his perception of who she is and her education level changes. Sounds like she's in a lot of pain. She is physical and spiritual pain. She had a vision. Could someone be in danger? No, it's fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> oh man, are there walk cycles during the medieval appropriate four foot first walk style or am I just imagining that? That is true. They, yep. they, they are. They yep. are doing that. All right, I'm gonna end, I'm just gonna go to sleep. All right, because I can just run through, there's nothing more, I can, I can do it. All right, we're only one minute after the hour. I go home. When were we going off to get married again? After, after you're done with your masterpiece, you're gonna go back to Nuremberg. Boop, little surprise, rent money. We got uh, sleep and fam. Got the sleep and fam. I love sleep and Ursula the best. Sleep and Ursula is so good. But they're uh, yeah, there's uh, they're all crammed in here, and then Gramps cozy Gartner's sleeps in his chair. Andreas is um, 20, 26 or twenty eight. I can't I think remember. Twenty six. Yeah. yeah. 26. And he has one one more uh, last oops. Jeez. Last reminder. His because uh, his character sheet gets filled out. So now you can see all the choices that you made uh, get filled out there. Were candles expensive? It depended on the candle. Uh, they probably realistically would not leave candles burning all night, but 
No, that's a game detail to help with visibility Come and also on. just mood setting. <laughs> um, beeswax candles were much more expensive than like tallow candles. Um, so they would probably have tallow candles here, which would not smell very nice, but there you go. Ain't that the way. Although there is a beehive next door, so maybe the Bowers make it. Yeah, the Bowers would. Yeah. All right, going to sleep. Getting in his J's. <laughs> Spend less on candles. <laughs> <laughs> Please, I'm a peasant. Someone in my family is dying. Someone who's good at peasant <laughs> economies, help me. Mm. All right. And that is the end of the first day. Thanks for watching. Awesome. We will be right back with Jeopardy and Jackbox. But before we leave, just want to say thank you so much to everyone who donated during this. We are now up to $27,350, awesome. which is the most we've ever raised. And without this, without you guys here for that and you guys here just to hang out, this would not be possible. So thank you all. Stay tuned and we will be right back. That's right. They're going to, oh, yeah. this game, when? Pentiment, is coming out Tuesday, November 15th. This Tuesday. This Tuesday, just a couple days. Xbox, Steam, Game Pass. Check it out. Oh, and right before that, Eric here with a very special announcement. Hello, friends and one and all. We ha have a very special announcement for the winner of the Xbox Series S a Spacer from Grounded Theme. And the winner is Tyler A. Martin. <laughs> Congratulations, Tyler and Martin. We will be reaching out to you to get your information, to get you your awesome uh, grounded theme Xbox. Bye, we'll be back. BRB! Oh, we didn't change the thing, but we'll do it later. Okay, bye.